Well, it's uh, 11.30 just about, and here at KFJC, we have a special guest this evening. Oh, yeah, you. Can you hear what's going on? Yeah. You can? Yeah. Oh, from here. Uh, <laughs> hello. My name is Genesis PRH, Throwing Gristle. Well, gentlemen, you're on. On what? On the air. Oh, I thought you meant, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we can start with some, some of the basic questions. Oh, we can. Here. Right. Mm. Uh, who are the members of Throbbing Gristle? Who are the members of, there's uh, Cozy Fanny Tootie, who's uh, a young lady who works as a striptease dancer and topless go-go dancer in London, and she plays lead guitar. Is she still working? That's what she's doing, well, uh, later on today. <laughs> she takes her knickers off for money and then plays guitar for fun. That's basically it. Yeah, she works every lunchtime, usually. And uh, then there's Chris Carter, who plays keyboards and rhythms and does the mixing. And there's Peter Christopherson, who plays trumpet and tape machines and processing. As in meat processing? What? I can't hear this. What? I'm half deaf, you know. Oh, sorry. As in meat processing? Meat processing. Or what kind of processing? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Well, you've heard the records all mangled. That's what he does. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, well, there's me, isn't there? Yeah, I play electric violin, bass guitar, and vocals, and mumbling. Right. How did, uh, how did Throbbing Gristle become a more or less musical group? More or less. <laughs> uh, boredom, of course. Well, we... we Nobody else seemed to want to do it, and we just wanted to put, have some records we could play, so we decided we'd have to do it. We just did what was inevitable. What was the story behind, uh, what was it, Come Transmissions, or I don't know how you pronounce it. But... See, you ask something like that, but like that's 10 years. Okay. We did things for 10 years. It's from live sex shows in Amsterdam to art exhibitions in Germany. And God. So Throbbing Gristle has existed for 10 years? No, not Throbbing Gristle. That's come transmissions. That's, that was kind of a performance group. We did a lot of sadomasochistic sexual things and pornography and <laughs> various degrading acts in public, preferably. And then it kind of... We always did music as a hobby. And then we got bored with everyone thinking what we were doing was art, so we decided to spoil it by doing whatever else we were worst at. How long? So we, oh, excuse me. So we just did the music. And uh, it coincided with the beginnings of the punk thing in London. Did you find that uh, the Throbbing Gristle's been confused with uh, punk bands a lot over in England? Initially, people expected us to do rock and roll, yeah. Three-minute rock and roll, because of the name and the image. But they soon learned. Many's the face of the young spiky head looking confused and catatonic. <laughs> drinking his beer and spitting into his own mouth in shock. How does one spit into one's own mouth? I'm curious. You watch Throbbing Crystal. <laughs> you sort of spit and it bounces off the wall of sound and hits you back in the face. Are most of your lyrics uh, totally improvised when you perform live or do you begin with a theme and, and go from there? Mainly improvised. Usually I have a subject. If I've read a book that seems kind of interesting, or I've seen a motor accident, or something good on the television, I get a lot of ideas off the television news. Is that the inspiration behind Hamburger Lady? That was from a letter from a friend who's a kind of brain damaged doctor in Oregon, who used to be a Vietnam medic, and now he works in the terminal ward in Oregon. Because I decided, I figured it out, he works there because. If he controls the insanity and gets a kind of daily level, he doesn't go totally insane. Whereas if he tried to sort of switch off from that scene or sort it out for himself, he'd go totally over the top. So he has to have an amount of horror every day. And that way he can just about hold himself together. And he sent a letter describing one of the cases he'd come across. And uh, I thought it was interesting. <laughs> so we decided to try and do something that reflected in sound the uh, situation. I think that cut was very effective. I know a couple mm. people who become very uncomfortable every time that one's put on. Yeah. That happens with a few things. Like the first side of Second Annual Report, 
when it first came out, the manager of Virgin Records took it home and played it to his girlfriend and went off to make a cup of coffee. And when he came back in the room, she was on the floor in tears, crying, get it off, get it off. And he told us about it. We were very proud of that. <laughs> All this talk about hamburgers and stuff made me, um, well, I hate to say hungry, but hungry. Uh, curious to say the least. Why don't we uh, take a break and listen to Hamburger Lady from the new Throbbing Gristle record? Fair enough? Well, that's fine with me, Bob. Good. Then we'll do it. This is KFJC with Hamburger Lady right now. From the uh, third annual report of Robin Gristle, that was the Hamburger Lady. And gentlemen, continue. Do you see yourselves as, as your statement as being, say, apocalyptic or uh, a social comment? Well, we just make up these phrases to try and trigger people's brains a bit. We don't actually decide which level they should be accepted on. We just want them to uh, think about it a little bit. It's kind of accurate in a physical sense, but it also has implications. And then people have to start thinking for themselves once more and figure out why. We don't mind if they disagree or they think it's pointless. And then that's why the logo is actually um, the ovens at Auschwitz, which we didn't know until I went to visit was actually referred to by the local people in Poland as the factory of death. So it came full circle because two years later we discovered the logo was actually from a place called the Death Factory, so it became even more accurate. But we used that building because it was actually like a conveyor belt for death. But if you look at the picture of the building, it could be any old industrial building. And until you know what happened there, it's not at all interesting. And then when you're told what the building actually was, suddenly it gets a whole new image, a whole new feel. And people say, what a horrible, outrageous thing. But it's not the building that was, it's how it was used. So we're interested in the whole blurring between the way people look at things and then how they get primed into thinking a certain way by the information they're told about something. This implies that you're somewhat of a historian or of concerned about past crimes and whatnot. Oh, yes. I'm concerned about human race being stupid. <laughs> basically, and that's gone on right through history, and we can't kind of use all the archetypes for human stupidity. Well, then you look at it and laugh, or are you involved in trying to change it? Uh, well, that's something you have to decide, really. Well, I figured you'd be the expert on it, so I'm asking you. Yeah, well, we don't give too many explanations, because if we did, people would stop thinking. That's the trouble with people at the moment. That's the whole point, is that they always want to be told what they're supposed to decide. They want a fixed answer on one level only, and there aren't any. There's lots of answers. Do you gear your material towards uh, achieving a certain reaction from an audience, or is it just put out there for the audience to respond to? We try and predict in our own minds. We try to manipulate people, definitely. The more, the merrier, really. And we like to always think about each record or track we've released and try and contradict it later in some form, so that they don't think of us as one formula. They think of each track on its own. And we just supply information, and then they take the information and analyze it or not. I mean, we give people complete freedom. We believe in individuals deciding for themselves. I don't think you can teach people anything. They can only recognize what they've learned from experience. So instead of teaching, it's more suggesting and giving a, some data and letting people do what they want with it. Yeah, well, I mean, we're interested in information. We're not interested in music as such. And uh, we believe that the whole battlefield, if there is one in the human situation, is about information. Like, we don't think that politicians or armies have any real power. We think that's just a facade. We think the real power lies with who controls the information. And so we deal with information not normally put into that context, like a record or a live gig. And by doing that, it kind of redirects people's vision and it condenses and focuses what they look at. Very abstract, eh? Well, it, it, it's a roundabout way of answering my question. You know, we're always roundabout. That's why the records go roundabout, roundabout. Speaking of records. He's a bully, this Bob. Hey. I'm here. You're a bully. I'm sorry. Big Bob's. We went to Big Bob's for chips on the way here. That's why we're on time. Wasn't it Bob's Big Boy? That's the one, yeah. Uh, Grease. Disgusting. I've got a stomachache now. Welcome to America. That's the home of uh, fast foods. 
Yes, they're trying to bring it to England now. It's horrible. They had a big conference with all these American guys saying you've got to eat all this stuff, you know. It's uh, revenge for uh, for the revolution. You're revenging yourselves on us for us <laughs> losing. That's disgusting. <laughs> I want I want to make this point. Can I do it now? Yes, by all means. Yes, I came here and I got here on July the 4th and I've done nothing but complain since. I want to make it clear that we want to reclaim America for England and we're going to claim all the back tax as well. And that's the only reason we've come to America to play at all. You can have my back taxes. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> Great. I'm about $200 behind. So we, we think, you know, they made a big mistake letting you lot get away with it. I'm really disgusted with the English. We, we lost all that money and petrol all that power we could have messed up vietnam for you and all this sunshine too what sunshine? Oh, i hate the sun <laughs> i come from the well, rainy city manchester well then what are you doing in california visiting friends monty i'm just here on a reconnoiter a reconnoiter yeah i'll look around well we're all coming back in september the whole group and then we may or may not depending on the sniffing about do something like quietly. like play live maybe if Something. Yeah, a demonstration. It depends. I mean, we've got to find the right place in the right situation. We don't want to go anywhere that's a rock and roll place. Oh, stay away from the Mabuhay. Yeah. Oh, God, the <laughs> Mabuhay. I didn't even go in. I went in the porno shop next door. I got lots of postcards of Carol Doda. <laughs> Carol Dodo? Doda. Doda, excuse me. <laughs> Everyone needs milk, even Carol Dodas. Okay, as Dirk would say. Uh, should we uh, hear another sampling of a throbbing gristle, if you don't mind me bullying you around? Oh, of course not, Bob. I love to be bullied. Oh. Get the whips out later. Uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. We have a new single that's sort of new, I guess. It's old material. Well, old material. is 76 old material. We yeah. already went through this, didn't we? Yes. Well, the idea <laughs> is that one side's 76 and one side's 79, so it spans three years. So you're getting three years material in one record. Uh, Just there's a big gap in between <laughs> that you can't hear. Well, that's what the inner groove's for, right? Mm. Moving right along. Yes, that's right, Bob. Yes, yeah. Around right, mellow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a really laid-back man, you know? Well, I got the tan to show it. Yeah, uh, yeah. We're going to hear We Hate You, Little Girls. And, and Carol Doda. It is dedicated to Carol Doda? Yes, please. All right, let's hear it. Not exactly the kind of stuff you'd like to fall asleep to. That's the new single from Throbbing Gristle, We Hate You Little Girls, dedicated to Carol Dota, who's not such a little girl herself. That's true. She was the perfect 36 at one time. Perfect 46. Yeah, now she's the perfect 89.7. <laughs> With Silicon Valley. That's us. Now that Throbbing Gristle have put out their third and final report, what's the next step? Uh, well, first of all, we used the money from that to do a single by Monty, who's here. And then an EP by a Swedish group called Leather Nun. Their and, first? Eh? Have, have they done anything before? No, none of them. <laughs> and then the first LP by Robert Rental and Thomas Lear. Um, and then after that, we are going to do a new TG LP, which should annoy all the people who think they're fans, we hope. And that should leave us free to do what we want afterwards. We're trying to cast off anyone who thinks they like us so that we feel not bullied or... Well, we're going to keep liking it just because you want, don't want us to. Uh, that's the thing that worries us the most. <laughs> well, as long as you do that, that's fine. It's the people who think they've figured out what we're doing that we want to sort of lose. Right? I can't imagine anyone even bother trying. Yeah? Oh, that's good. What are you asking questions for? <laughs> for our amusement. He's, a, he's at it again. <laughs> I'm told there's 50,000 people out there and the record sales have just dived. They think if they're going to play records like that, we're not buying any more. It's already sold out. Is it? Oh, yes, so it is. Uh -huh. Never mind, they'll still think the next one's going to sound like that, but it won't. So uh, tell me, what's the theory behind putting an, al an album or a single, sorry, something out in limited enough quantities just to piss everybody off that didn't quite get there in time? We're just perverse. <laughs> that's all there is to it. There's no big theory behind that. That's a good, that's a good answer. <laughs> I remember getting the letter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I remember that with the playlist. Questions. An off-the-wall question here. What happened to the calendar of the new little girl that came with the first copies of DOA? What, you didn't get one? No. Well, the reason is there was a copy in with the first 1,000 that went to shops, and then only in the mail-order ones after that. So we got lots of letters from people saying, 
My friend got one and he got a calendar of a new little girl, but I never got one. Why not? However, if people write to us direct, even now, they uh, usually get one. Uh, we're going to beat that. We're releasing 24 hours of live tapes all in one set. Only one copy, right? Oh, no. No, we, there'll be as many as people want. Really? And you can buy them individually if you don't want to buy the whole lot. And we're going to put in a list of recommended, you know, 7 out of 10, 9 out of 10, 1 out of 10. The hits, the hits in other words. Oh, right? No, no hits, just <laughs> everything, you know. <laughs> the good, the bad, and the totally indifferent. Right. The, the, the hits thing reminds me of I, the, the, that one song, uh, United, yeah. which is not really characteristic of the rest of the material, and to the point where it's almost a pop song. Almost. Almost. Almost, but not quite. Yeah, we've been trying to live that down ever since. <laughs> Well, I thought I'd bully you around some more. Yeah, that's all right. Carry on. I read in an interview that you said that the reason you put that on the album as a 16-second track was to annoy people who thought they'd be getting a single. That's right. Free, yeah. Well, people always... That's why there was no times on the back, you see, so that people wouldn't know it was a short version until they looked on the center label. And then they'd think, oh, great, I'm getting united as well. I don't need to buy the single. Or else they'd say, oh, they're just doing what everyone else does and putting a hit single on the LP. <laughs> Yeah. So either that's an example of us trying to manipulate response a little bit in advance. But actually, if you turn it by hand very, very slowly, I on tried the it. you can just about tell what it is. Couldn't do that with Zyklon B Zombie, though. No. Oh, well, that just stands on its own, really. I think. Oh, he wants us to carry on talking. He's waving his hand. I want to hear Robert Rental. Can we hear a track off the... Uh, you it's ready? not on mic, I guess. I'll just tell everybody what it is. This is a, an LP we recorded at Industrial Records the week before I came out here, and I've got a cassette of the tape which has absolutely no titles at all yet, but should have been cut by the time I get back, and uh, we'll be out around September. And they're two Scottish guys who both did singles that are on that Business Unusual compilation. And we went along and said, we want you to do something together. They've never done anything together before, although they've known each other a long time. And it was recorded in their flat in a big council estate in South London. We, we hired loads of equipment and took it down to this tiny flat and they kicked their girlfriends out and just stayed up for two weeks just recording. We're going to hear Robert Rental and Thomas Lear cut one, side one, here we go. Before we uh, get too far carried away, this is KFJC Los Altos Hills. It's one minute after midnight and we are in the process of talking with Monte Cazazzo and Genesis Spioridge of uh, various industrial records projects and we were, uh, while well, we were talking, let's continue. Sounds like that's about it. Yeah. Let's put that one on hold for a moment. And that was Robert Rental and Thomas Lear from an album that is even untitled title-wise. Yeah, maybe they'll have thought of something to say when we get back. I don't know. Should be cut anyway. But maybe it'll just be left just with their names on, like just Thomas Lear and Robert Rental. Doesn't really matter. Sounds like it's uh, a little bit more accessible than what we are used to from industrial. Oh, it is, it is, which is a very good way to lead into our guest here tonight, because as we're talking about other people on the label, we've got Monte Cazazza here, who is definitely inaccessible. In fact, the NME, when they reviewed his single, which came out in England about three weeks ago, they had the best single, single of the week, best of the rest, and then a special section called Hell for Monte Cazazza. <laughs> We wanted the first record by someone else on Industrial to make it clear that United and other things like that were not the only side of the coin, that we weren't going to suddenly go normal. About Monty. About Monty. Well, he's here. Why don't you ask him something about it? Um, I'd like him to talk. Should we listen to it and then talk about Can it? Can we listen that to it? Yes, good. and then all talk, you see. Okay, let's do that. Let's, let me I'll tell you what. Uh, we were talking about uh, the pop popular aspects of, oh, of, Robert uh, Rental. Of, of Robert Rental and Throbbing Gristle. And we, for those of you who have never heard the Throbbing Gristle hit, I thought we should hear United. Yeah, okay. So we're we'll going to play, play United and then to Mom on Mother's Day. we Will do. The new 45 from Monte Cazaza to Mom on Mother's Day. I would say interesting. Monty. Yeah. Come in, Monty. Yeah, I'm here. Bob. Uh, any particular relevance to uh, or significance to that title? No. <laughs> no, just random. No, it's not random. 
Don't you don't have to look at him. It's about Mother's it's Day. About, it's about it's about Mother's Day. I mean, everybody has a mother. True. Some more in touch with than others. That's true. Did you give your mother a copy? No, like my mother's like kind of she's like Sicilian, you know. If I gave her a copy, she would like you know hire some mafia hitman <laughs> come and shoot me in the head with a twenty-two, and I'd probably end up in the Berkeley Marina or something. You know? <laughs> So, no, I didn't give her one. She'd get, she'd get upset. She's upset enough already. Uh, was this recorded in this area? No. It was no. recorded when I was in England. Which was how long ago? Uh, 78. Yeah, 78. Yeah. Well, it was. it's not quite as simple as that. What happened was uh, Monty came over to England and we instructed him that he was going to make a record because he had no interest in records. And then he wrote the lyric with Judith Bell who lives in Los Angeles, and we got him to do the vocals first, and we put headphones on him with an electronic bleep going through so he couldn't hear his own voice, and recorded the vocals, and we didn't let him listen to any of the vocals afterwards. We did six songs. And then we kept the tape till he'd come back to America, and all the music was added later with two guitars and a drum kit. And so when the record was released, Monty had never heard any of it at all, and the first thing he received in the mail was actually a review, and he still hadn't heard the record. Do you like what came out of it, Monty? Yeah, it's okay. So it's kind of un a new approach to doing a record, but it's the ultimate record company situation where they don't bother to tell the artist what he's done even. <laughs> and his contract is nice too because it's signed in blood and it's for life. Who's blood? Well, the directors of industrial records have signed in blood and Monty and a witness have signed in blood. And we've got photos of them slashing their wrists. And then it's for life and he's entitled to no royalties. And he has to deliver... Two, the enough songs for two records a year, but we have no obligation to release them, and he's never ever allowed to record for any other label. Benevolent. How how did Industrial Records become so benevolent? Um, well, we just looked around at CBS and Warner Brothers and took a hint from them. <laughs> <laughs> We're in trouble. Are we in trouble? No, it's okay. Go I like ahead. to be in Go trouble. Go ahead and lampoon anyone you wish. Eno. We've been talking about Eno while we were listening to those records. Well. Fire. What were we saying? About Let's not deprive the audience of... The downhill slide of Brian, you know. The past. downhill slide. He never started up. He went from the gutter down into the drains. <laughs> Would uh, you care to we back that up with some philosophy? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't have philosophy. I just well, have gossip. <laughs> okay, gossip will do then. Yeah. Well, I was saying that he was the first person to try and get Throbbing Gristle to record on a, a real label. Could you call it a label? He wanted us on obscure records. And he heard about us doing a piece of music with 12 bicycle wheels um, and breaking eggs and things. It was kind of silly, but we were having fun, passing the time. And he kept ringing us up and saying, you people are really strange. You must come down and play us your tape and I'll make a record of it. And we said, well, OK, we'll play you the tape when. And he'd make a time and then we'd ring to check it was OK to go. And he'd say, oh, no, you can't come tonight because I'm meeting John Cale, and I'm trying to reform the Velvet Underground with me in it. And so, after about six weeks of him postponing it, because he was telling us he was then working with David Bowie or Bowie, and, and all the f he kept just telling us famous people that were more important than his meeting with us. We just literally told him to fuck off. And then ten... <laughs> beg your pardon? Beep. Oh, beep. Yes. And then ten night. minutes later, hello, America, you don't know these words. <laughs> Ten minutes later, he rang back and said he was very sorry because I think he realized he might lose money. Um, How? Well, he knew he could sell the records and he's basically into money. You know, He's only a wimp. He's ever so wet when you meet him. He's going bald and he always has a feminist girlfriend. And you know, He sort of dresses low-key and talks about tape recording worms. Sounds like he'd do real well in California. Mm, I doubt it. I no? mean, even the Californians could see through that facade, actually. <laughs> Although I must admit, this journey, this time, I, I really am confused by America this time. Last time I came, I kept saying, it's not really so bad. They're not that crazy. But we this, are. Yes, definitely. Would you care to cite a particular example aside from this radio station? Uh, no, this is all right. We came here because you were nice on the phone. And we got a good letter. I like the letter that came, too, to England. I forget what it was. Well, it, it actually was helpful. It said, you know... It wasn't just asking for free records. It said, this is the kind of stuff we play, and here's the playlist to prove it. And it was straightforward, and you said, you know, if you send records, we may play them, which is all we want to know. Whereas everyone else either pretends that they're not trying to scrounge free records or ask for them, and then when they get them, go, oh, God, what the hell's this, and never play them. That's why we've not done any of the other radio stations in this area, because you've played the records. 
and we decided we wouldn't do the other ones. Oh, Hello, Mr. Klein, or whatever your name is. What's yeah. his name? Is that it? Klein? You miss out, Mr. Klein. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> Where were we up to? I was just getting into the mood. Oh, yes, right. Americans, why are they strange? Yes. Well, that's the thing. This time, I'm not sure. It's, it's, I mean, it's hard to... It's, I'm trying to pinpoint it desperately while I'm here. But there's, it's basically a total lack of reality. I know that's an awful word to use. I hate abstract words. But I haven't... Like you go past a street full of people and there's nobody there who's actually aware they exist. They're going through motions, but you can tell they're just in a TV program. It's, and all these are such cliches, I know that, but I never realised before that there was basically nobody living here. Does that explain it? I mean, well, it, it, I can see it from, from a lot of people that work in what we call Silicon Valley, because they basically spend their lives working their eight hours, going home, watching TV, going to sleep, and on the weekends going to Lake Merced. Right, you are now a component of the workforce. It's, it's kind of, it's very hard to pinpoint what the crucial point is where they, they lose contact, but there's just nothing coming off them at all. It's very peculiar, it's very uncomfortable. I keep looking at them, and, and like in the bank or the shops, and in the cafe, Big Bob's or whatever it was, Big Jobs, I don't know. <laughs> that place down the road and I can't feel anything at all there's just like they're not flesh I, I mean I really can't explain it except that it's worrying and I'm glad I don't live here now well how different is it uh, uh, in England well in England even the idiots kind of have a certain gutsy smell and things you know everyone here has de is deodorized yes in every way <laughs> mentally most of all that's the horrible part the brains have gone in a lot of people it sounds awfully uh, arrogant but i think i can afford to be arrogant with america <laughs> i mean the huge populace i mean what's there's, the good thing is that because of that it's easy to pinpoint the people who do think this brings to uh to my mind if there anyone out there that would like to pose questions now that we're getting into this let's get offensive no i'm not being offensive well I... let's be open and honest and yeah. vent our feelings uh, if you have questions you would like to ask Genesis or uh, Monty, by all means, give us a call at 948-8819, and we will have operators standing by, and that way we can translate the message up here to uh, the Brain Trust, if you'll excuse the expression. Mm, I wish there was some to trust. Hey, oh, they're in already. A phone, a phone call already saying, who is this English person? Get rid of them. So uh, this... Well, Monty's American, and I, I, I know he doesn't like living here, and he doesn't like America. Maybe you should ask him why he feels not at home in his own country. Okay, that's a good one. Monty. Yeah? Uh, well, Because let's... people hate me, that's why, for no real reason. Why? Why do they hate I think it's, I really think it's like a biochemical feeling. They're not sure. They can't intellectualize, like, why they hate me, you know. I just, like, walk down the street, and for no particular reason at all, someone will go by in their car and say something nasty or throw a brick, or if there's six or seven of them, then they're really tough, you know. They'll get out and chase me, or who knows what the hell they'll do. Perfect opportunity to... Yeah, it's a perfect opportunity. Oh, I do. Good. But I mean, like, you know, the only time they'll do it is usually when there's a bunch of them. But there's no real reason that they do it. You know, basically, I think it's because they're unhappy with their own life. Maybe jealousy, and I don't even see why they're jealous of me, because I certainly don't have, like, I can't, you know, I don't own a big car or a big home, or I'm not rich. So, you know, I can't see why they act that way. You're not uh, within the norm. Yeah, that upsets people. Right, I believe. And 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 I think they sense that like I can, in a way, I can stand on my own. You know, and they don't like that. They don't like that because they're afraid to admit that they're on their own. And they're gonna die on their own, and that's it. And they're born on their own. I guess people like to be in gangs as well. They like to feel part of a gang, right down the line from kids at school, right up to politicians or religions or any dogma. And when they see somebody who says that they're prepared to figure out their own philosophy and stick to it regardless of the trouble, they always want to uh, stamp on it. The old, old story. It's like that cliche, you know, no club, lone wolf. But this time it's got to the witch hunt. You know, you had the Live at the Witch Trials on earlier on with The Fall. I don't like The Fall, but it's a good title for an LP because I'm sure the witch trials are coming again. And we're the kind of people, not just us, I mean we, I mean you here too. A lot of the young people now, that's why they feel the way they do and they're getting more extreme. They realise they're the witches of the future and they're, they're in great danger. And America is always a step ahead. And the people here are 
trained to stamp quicker and they have more weapons to stamp with. And when the earthquake comes or whatever, they're just going to go out there and they're going to be so terrified they're going to shoot anything that doesn't doesn't fit in. So beware and get guns. I don't have to worry about it. I'm going to be buried underneath the records. Well, that's, it's a good camouflage. Black vinyl for the night. Oh. oh. I love Captain. Captain. Hello. Hello. We have some, some phone calls from some people. We're going to attempt to put them on the air, and if you can hear them, we're going to go ahead and just put them on and see what happens, okay? okay. So uh, be prepared for anything. Uh, Screams. Uh, and listener. With for your protection all over the toilet seat. Hello, listener. Yeah, just, uh, Hello. I, I hadn't really figured that out until uh, he uh, said something about it. And I just wanted to thank him for it. What did he say? Sorry, could you say that again? One more time. Listener? Hello. Thank you for the thank you, but what have we done? Repeat it. Repeat it. We can't hear you. Oh, he's... Sounds like turned down your radio. No, it's okay. He was nice, whoever he was. He just got scared of it. Oh, well, well. Thank you anyway. Let's try... Let's try the other caller, okay? Hello? I have a question for Monty Cazazas. Yeah, okay. Shoot. Um, when I heard your name, I sort of uh, freaked out because I'd heard it once before about four or five years ago at Marine World Africa, USA. And I was wondering if you could see any connection in this. The idea it was the only time I'd ever ridden an elephant. They have an elephant ride up there. And when I got off the elephant, I heard this little kid ask his mother. And he said, uh, Mommy, Mommy. She said, What? And he said, She said, What's the matter? And he says, The elephant hurt my casazas. Do you see any connection here with your work? No, not really. I know there's a castle in Italy named after me. I'm going to try and appropriate it when I go over there because I think it really does belong to me, but that's all I can say. Okay, well, check out that elephant. I think there may be a connection. Thanks no, very no, much. boy. And I really uh, really got off on your music there uh, in both ways. Oh. So thank you now. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> See you later. Okay. Oh, I told you America was strange. And they all listened to us. Oh, I love Captain. Hello. Hello. You're on, listener. Uh, I'm uh, Howie Klein, and uh, boy, am I pissed. <laughs> I like it. Thank you, listener. <laughs> Very good. Oh, let's try it again. Nice listener, one. you're on the air. We're getting all the industrialists in now. <laughs> okay, you're on the air, kid. Hello. Hello. I've got a question for Monty Cazaza. Okay, go, hey, go ahead. Can you tell me something you do like? That I do like? Yeah. Just yesterday we went to the firing range. I like going to the firing range. It's lots of fun. That's true. Up in Oakland, we went to the shooting range and fired pistols for ages and ages. I would also like to ask Genesis a question. Yeah. Or ask him to talk about something. You're English. Could he talk about the British Post Office? You're English. Could you prove that? Uh, I can tell from the accent, dear. It's only a rumour. <laughs> well, I have telepathic powers, I can tell. It's obvious to us. But anyway, what do you want to know about the Post Office? Me being prosecuted or what? Yes, I'd like to hear about persecution. But does everybody else want to hear about persecution? That's very old. No. All I can say is I was once prosecuted for sending indecent mail and fined £300, and the next time I get caught, I get 12 months in jail. There's a book on it anyway. You can buy it. It's called GPO v. GPO. Still in print? Yeah, it's still in print, yeah. It's then it just... must not be in an industrial records project. No, no, it was printed by the Eckhart Gallery in Geneva in Switzerland. Basically, just to make sure that if all our files were stolen and burned, people could still find out what happened, that's all. It's no big deal. Satisfied, listener? Yeah, that's all right. Okay. See you later. See ya. Bye. You are listening to KFJC, and we do have uh, all kinds of interesting things going on here, if you haven't already picked it up. It's just about 12.30, and we're going to continue on. Is that it? No more phone calls. Well, that's that seems to be it for the time being. If anyone would like to ask questions of either Genesis or Monty, by all means call in. The number should be 
8819, and uh, we do have an operator standing by. Do you, want, do you want some more music now, mister? That's what they usually do at this point. At this point, I think we should hear some music. This uh, single over here, uh, Non? Yes, it's a guy called Boyd Rice, who lives in El Cayon, yeah, near yeah. San Diego. He's American, very thin, very white, and he says that He's called his music industrial music. He wrote and asked us if we minded because he said it didn't seem to fit any other genre. And he sent us this single and we really like it. And everyone out there should try very hard to find a way to buy it. I don't know where the hell you'll buy it, but if you ask enough, maybe people will get a hold of it. He played one concert maybe a month or so ago in San Francisco and even a lot of the people who go to the Mabuhe were going out saying it hurt their ears and that can't be bad. So... The thing is, he can play it at 16, 33, 45, and 78. Okay, I've, I've got it tried uh, basically straight, and if need be, we can go through it in its various yeah. forms. It's got two holes as well, so that uh, what we, we said we'd try and do is play it at 45 in the normal hole first. I've got 33. Let's... Oh, well, at 33 through the second hole. I've got 45. Now I've got 45 through the center hole. Okay, we'll try it that way. Let's try that and then see what we come up with, okay? Mm-hmm. Here we go. Seems to be uh, the bulk of that song. Any good stories we have on that? Oh, we were just talking about San Francisco, and uh, he, he has a guitar, but he has a big domestic fan strapped onto it so that when he plays, it kind of shoots out of his hands. He's a very anti-music person, and his records are anti-records. I like it because he's so extreme. What's, what's his name again? Boyd Rice. That's B-O-Y-D-R-I-C-E. But we call him Boiled Rice. <laughs> in our typically English flippant manner. But I like him, and he's American, which is good. It's good to know there's life in San Diego apart from the scorpions. Apart from the scorpions? Well, there must be scorpions. It's a desert. I mean, don't forget the English are very uneducated about America. We just assume everywhere is the way well, we're told on the TV. We're going to have to use uh, you as a liaison through, then. Your thing's two dimensional, and it flashes across the screen 30 times per second. Well, that's you talking. Wasn't that good? It sounded like it was somebody ghost. <laughs> We have another caller on the line. Caller? Hello? Caller, come in. Yes, it's me. Go. Yes, I would like to ask what exactly were the ramifications of the curdler system. The curdler? Somebody's been reading Search and Destroy, all the industrial news. Uh, yeah, well, Monty knows a little bit about what's happened to it, So, and he was the one who originally sent us the information. So uh, I guess he should answer what happened to that. Okay, originally was developed to be used in Vietnam from helicopters, right, when they wanted to, you know, when they wanted to, like, fly over Hamlet, right, and they wanted to make an announcement, like, everybody get out, because we're going to burn it down, okay? Everybody get out, because we're going to burn it down, right? So they had to, they had to develop this portable sound speaker uh -huh. system. So what they did was then, like, uh, they, they worked on it for a long time, and right. then what they eventually did is they filtered down to, like, police departments so they could, like, break up riots stuff like that, because you can send, like, high frequencies through it, you know, oh, yeah. it just drives you deaf. I mean, like, on the streets at night, it's really insane. A way yeah. of using sound in order to uh, make people susceptible to certain stimuli, then? No, they, well, they wanted, like, whenever there would be a demonstration, they want to break it up as quickly as crowd possible, control. and it's crowd control mainly. I, I've been trying to get a hold of one, but it's really difficult. The company that made it was, like, in Alexandria, Virginia, <laughs> home of the CIA, <laughs> But they've gone out of business, supposedly. Who are the CIA? So the, the firm... Actually, who, they are going out of business. But we're trying to get one second-hand from the army surplus at the moment. And the thing broke up frequencies in such a way that if people were chanting slogans, the slogans got kind of harmonics that made them unintelligible. And also it engendered a metabolic feeling of panic. Because, ah. you, you know, all sound doesn't just go in the ears, it goes in all the body all the time, of course. And so the cells felt uncomfortable. The frequencies were very uncomfortable and people felt frightened and just wanted to get out of the area. So it was, I mean, the, the police have the access to it. And like all these things, they don't have to use it, but they like to know they have the chance. I see. Um, Does that help? Is, yes. Is, uh, another thing also I'd like to ask. Yeah. Is, that, is that if uh, throbbing gristle in, in the music and the frequencies, if they're sort of, if they're trying to generate a certain state of mind and stuff. Yeah, we do. We use subliminals and high frequencies That's mainly, uh, especially in live gigs, which of course you won't have experienced probably, but 
um, when we play live, it's much more much different to the records. Although there are bits of live things on record, the first time we tried to cut second annual report, it blew up the machine because of the frequencies. And they said it was impossible to make a record with those frequencies, and we had to remix the tapes, which was a pity. But I think that explains the story that I was saying earlier, the anecdote about the woman feeling upset and not knowing why. Uh, we also use negative ion generators, very, very big ones. And we've been using them for three years, but in England until six months ago they were illegal. So we never used to tell people. And uh, now we're allowed to say we've got them. But the actual um, strength of them is still nine times the legal limit. Uh, and we, we yeah. use subliminal cut-up tapes that people can't hear with instructions or messages. And we, we test out high frequencies and low frequencies on ourselves. Chris Carter, who's our electronics whiz kid, builds gadgets all the time, builds synthesizers, and we both did experiments with very, very, very high frequencies in our studio, and he got tunnel vision, and then he went blind, and our clothes were, sh were moving as if there was a strong wind, and yet there was no wind, and we could actually see crisscross patterns in the, in the air. I didn't go blind, he did. We both got different effects. I, I got very hungry, and that was, we did it for about maybe 10 minutes, and all the things in the room were, of course, moving, you know, like there was a strong hurricane. Uh, and we, we used to finish when we played live with 10 minutes of ultrasonics so that people would leave feeling incredibly confused, which I think is of course. very close to the curdler effect, in fact. What is the curdler The curdler effect? was the thing he referred to before, which was the police riot control system, which, again, projected very high frequencies at crowds from a battery-operated generator. It's this, uh, I forget the title of it, but what you were referring to that was illegal oh, until the, recently. The, what, what made it become legal again, or legal for the first time? Uh, well, big business and vested interest, of course. They discovered that the air conditioning systems in America were producing positive ions, and positive ions now medically can be seen to uh, paralyze the little hairs in the lungs and the tubes in the lungs that get all the, the dirt out of your lungs and shove it up to the top. And also, positive ions create headaches and can create nausea. And negative ions are created by, say, lightning and thunderstorms or something like that. And you know how people say, oh, I feel better after a thunderstorm and they also get headaches before. Well, this was always thought to be an old wives' tale and now they realize there's actually a physiological explanation. So once they saw that negative ions, which are the opposite of positive ions, cancel that effect, their reasoning for making it legal is that in offices, if they build them into the air conditioning, um, the people feel better, don't get headaches, therefore work harder and are more productive, like Muzak. Yeah. Also, strip lights, you know, neon lights, mm -hmm. they have part of the spectrum missing and cause hypersensitivity and, again, headaches and also uh, semi... They have a, a, a negative effect on the brain's functions. Oh. So once they realized that they could, they being, you know, whoever you want to call the control process, but business or whoever could get a kind of increased activity and productivity from the people who were sat in these horrible little square holes, then it was suddenly legal after being quackery and uh, ephemeral science for a long, long time. But we, we were interested in subliminal effects on people and using control systems back in an anarchic way you know, demonstrating effects in live situations, and that's why we were using them. But we had to pay somebody secretly to build us some industrial-sized negative ion generators. And, of course, then suddenly everyone goes, oh, wow, man, you've got negative ion generators. That's great. But uh, until then, we had to keep quiet. We just called them machines. We used to say, oh, those are just machines in the corner. But the only time we played live and had a really big fight was the day we didn't take them with us. I mean, you can't. it's something you can't measure. You can't go out and say, somebody's sat in a hall and it's on, and they, they don't suddenly feel high or anything. But there is a tendency towards a feeling of relaxation and well-being, which we thought was, why not have that as well, you know? And the two or three times when it's either been on a very short time or not on at all, we've noticed were the times when things got heavy. Uh, so that's the nearest we can get to scientific evidence. But we believe that it does make people feel better, and uh, we like to use any technique that we read about and check out what's going on. Okay, I've got a question uh, that will follow a caller we have on the phone. Caller? Um, yeah, I was wondering what uh, you used as far as uh, lighting went in your concerts, because you, you mentioned earlier that, uh, that neon lights can produce disconcerting effects, and uh, things like lasers 
can, uh, and very, very bright lights can produce kind of strange effects too. But uh, do, you, do you use things like that in your uh, concerts? Uh, at the moment, all we use is halogen lamps. Do you know what those are? Halogen lamps? Hello? Oh, well, anyway. Uh, in England, they use them, for instance, on the motorway when there's a big crash or in railway marshalling yards and they're used in photographic studios. They're very, very bright white light and um, we usually have two or three of them facing the audience so that if they try and look at us, they get temporary blindness and they can't focus on any people. They just see a kind of blurred silhouette and it burns the retina out if you try and stare straight into it. I've got a question then about, uh, you mentioned about people trying to affect them in your performance. I imagine you've managed to get some comments from people about how they perceived your concerts. Yeah, it's strange. Most of the comments sound either like um, almost religious experience or even more commonly some form of drug addiction. People's comments are very closely related, much more to a physical sensation. They very rarely mention it in a musical way. They talk about uh, it as a complete experience and being disoriented but also excited and stimulated physically, as if they've taken a new drug. And the people who really get into it, they come to every single gig, wherever it is. I mean, they travel four, five hundred miles, and it's as if they need a fix, and they actually immediately say, you know, when are you on a game, when are you on a game? Um, and we used to originally refer to it before we thought of the industrial music tag as metabolic music, and we always wanted to make it something that was for every part of the body, both disturbing and relaxing and stimulating, and boring. Now, would you consider that success? Is that what you have in mind in performance? Well, I don't want them to come and say that was a great guitar lick. I'd much rather <laughs> they came up and said, uh, uh, it's tr actually, there's a, also a delayed action effect. Like people would say, that wasn't music and I hated that on the day it happens. And then a week later, they'll write or ring and actually say, I couldn't get it out of my mind. It kept haunting me and I'm really glad and I really like it now. Um, Yes, that's what we want. We want people, we want to create something which you can't get any other way. That's what live music is meant to be about. We don't want it to be like the records. When you go and see us live, it's different to records, and that's the whole point. It's extra. It's not the same thing regurgitated just to be entertaining. It's a physical, mental, and intellectual experience. And it's noise, too, in its broadest sense. Okay. Well, should we... Uh Take a break and hear some music for a little while. Yes, by all means, do. I do have this cued now for uh, this not this um, non. The other version. The other version. Uh, I've got it at 45 on the outside track. Is that what you had in mind? Uh, what you need is 33 on the hole that's not in the center right. and on the third track. Third track. I think. Otherwise, it'll throw the needle off and smash it. Oh yeah. Yes. And this is what we need at this high finance station. Yes, which I don't think is wise at this stage. I like it because it has physical effects on the equipment, this record, which is an interesting extension. For those of you listening at home, there we have a single here with uh, two holes in it. This, uh, this hole is going to annoy our engineers, but we're going to do it nevertheless. It's just the desired effect. All right. That's right. You're listening to KFJC. Yeah, I'm sure it's the first time it's ever been on the radio. And I, I like it because it's the structure of it does about four or five things that nobody's bothered to done before. Such uh, as? Well, the two holes and the, the loop tapes. And the B side is just completely clear, you know, no grooves on it at all. So when you put the needle on, it just hangs on the spot you put it, makes its own groove and just gives you the sound of the surface. And he's not copped out like most people do and use it as a gimmick. The actual record is exactly how it, it's meant to be, with no trimmings and no luxuries. I, I'm very impressed. Hit pick of the week. Yeah. <laughs> now, this uh, fellow be, uh, searched you out, or you searched him out? or Yeah, he searched us out in London. He'd heard, I guess, some of the records or something, and he turned up after about three weeks of trying to find us at the house. And uh, he's really nice, very young, I think. But he's done an LP, too. Um, and it's, again, it's just called 16, 33, 45, 78. And it's, uh, the middle label is just a lot of broken records. And again, it's all just instrumental. I don't like the LP as much because it's kind of too long, really. And it's, it's much more music -y. But the single, I think, is better because it's con concise, you know. And it's funny, too. It's kind of scary, also. 
Yeah, well, that's, it's, I mean, in one small single, he's managed to do a lot of different things. And uh, I like, I think that's really good. I think the single is his best thing, definitely. We were talking about some of the bands that you like that are currently making records and currently, whether either innovating or uh, just doing something interesting or yeah. something that sounds good. And uh, give us give us your top ten. Or um, what English and American? And yeah. What do, you, what do you think? You know, what, what's, I like, what's good? I like James James White and the Blacks, or James Chance and the Contortions, whichever name he wants to uh, take. I like that first track on the second side of No New York because it's a good dance number. It's the only record I dance to at the moment, apart from Monty. Well, let me go find it. You know the one I mean? I think it's called Contort Yourself. Yeah. yeah. And I like right um, the guy who was in DNA. No, no, not that one. Not the peeny peeny one. The, uh, I don't remember his name. I never remember names. <laughs> his, his record's DNA. called Dark Day. From DNA, we have uh, Iku Ili, which I'm mispronouncing, Robin Crutchfield. That's the guy, Robin Crutchfield. I knew it had a, a C and a, a field on it. He's done a single called Dark Day, which is very pretty. And I like uh, Egomaniac Kiss, too, on that one. What's the song you like to dance to? Oh, Contort Yourself. It's the first, the first one by James Chance, anyway. And I really love that one. Tracks by Contortions are Dish It Out. Flip That's it, Dish It Out. Dish I'm it sorry, out. Dish It Out. Yes, Contort Yourself is the 12-inch single, isn't it, by James White and the Blacks. You're right. Can dish it out. Yes, that's the one. Can dish I dance for us? What? Or at least make some motions? Oh, I'll make a motion. Okay, here we go. It's good. Have you heard this, Monty? It's good. You'll like this. It reminds me of Monty. Now, about R.L. Crutchfield. Yeah. He's just pretty. I think it's nice that he could produce a pretty record. That's Invisible Man, right? Yeah. Well, both sides are very similar, actually. That's the trouble. I think he's getting into a formula too quick, but... It's pretty, nevertheless. I played it to the rest of TG, and I was surprised because they all actually liked it, and normally they usually hate anything that I recommend. I mean, we all have completely different record collections. And we don't. That's something we should get into after we hear Invisible Man. Okay. Okay? Yes. And you were talking about uh, the varying tastes among the four members of Throbbing Gristle. Mm. We have some idea of yours, I guess, or at least what's current. Yeah. Uh, well, like Chris really really likes abba i don't know do people in america know about abba the oh, swedish yeah. group yeah very 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 pop he's, he sneaks some abba into uh, ag7 he's he's written so many times for their fan club that he's now been made an honorary life member and he wears abba t-shirts and it's very embarrassing to have with us really. <laughs> <laughs> he has an abba haircut and white polo neck sweaters and abba soap and posters of the abba club. soap oh yeah you can abba get abba clogs not clogs. Can you get the clogs? Oh. Yes. Oh, he hasn't got clogs, no. Do we have yeah, that poster anymore? Poster poster on the way way out. Out. We, um, used, we used to have a great ABBA poster with all these merchandising offers. You could get an ABBA mm. jacket and ABBA clogs. He probably those. knows about them because the fan club letters and things. And he was really... When when the blonde one, Agnetha or Aggie, decided to get divorced, he rushed around to the house and said, I've got a chance. There's hope for me yet. <laughs> <laughs> and he was quite serious. It wasn't a joke. I mean, people think at first it's kind of a hip, cool put-on, and then they realise he genuinely likes them. Uh, and that's why his track on DOA is A, B, stroke, 7A. It was the nearest you could get to writing ABBA, because the stroke and the 7 make a little B. And on that track, there's actually five hit singles by ABBA playing simultaneously, and that's what makes that phasing noise in the background. That means we're going to have to play it. Because mm -hmm. uh, We it. couldn't, of course, put that on the cover notes, because it's totally illegal, and I hope their agents aren't listening. <laughs> John Savage mentioned it in the review. And, Did uh, he mention it? Maker. Yeah. He's not supposed to. <laughs> Typical John Savage. That's the trouble of having people who know too much. Well, as long as we don't get sued. And I suppose Chris would enjoy it because he might meet them. <laughs> well, shall we hear Chris's piece, uh, more or less translated to Abba? Abba, yes. It's, A -B. Meant, it's Abba. That's the real title. And we're going to see if you can identify the singles. I'm going to try. I know there's Waterloo on it. Yeah? And the name of the game, yes. You might be amused to know that that is the hit from the record to date. The hit? Yes. In fact, this song is in our top ten. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, Chris will be pleased. Yes. I, I was just saying it, it shows he's got a sense of proportion in that he can still deliberately mangle the record so that the most pop-oriented track also mangles the most pop-oriented group and destroys them into noise. 
Anyway, it'd be good for... I mean, I still listen to the, the sort of phasing noise in the background trying to figure out which records which. He's not told us which the five records are. I couldn't identify any of them, and I am uh, have definite tendencies to listen to ABBA when no one is around. Yes, well... <laughs> um, you wanted to know other things? I was just saying... Some other taste uh, opinions and stuff uh -huh. for the other rest of the folks. Well, S Sleazy, which is our nickname for Peter Christopherson, Sleazy's favourite musician is John Barry, who does lots of film soundtracks, especially James Bond films. How did he get uh, the name Sleazy? You haven't seen him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when we first met him, he had this horrible droopy moustache and this satin shirt and was really sleazy, you know? And uh, we didn't know his other name then, so that was pleasing. You can tell how normal in his first appearance Chris is in that he's never developed a nickname. Uh, but Sleazy, I was just also talking, we keep talking, everybody should understand that we talk a lot in between when the records are on. And we were just saying that the only thing that all of us, all four of us, agree on liking is Captain Beefheart. Uh, I don't know if that shows in our records, but it's an interesting fact. The only person we all put down when we made a list of likes was Captain Beefheart. And three of us also said Nico. And we all liked the Doors too, early Doors, Jim Morrison, because we're kind of nostalgic in our own quiet way. Romantics at heart. Uh, Cozy also likes Vera Lynn. I know you won't have any of her records. Vera Lynn, I've heard the name. That's she's been it. made a dame by the Queen, Dame Vera Lynn, and she's the woman who sang Land of Hope and Glory. During the war, she made a lot of very patriotic records and used to cheer on the troops as they went to get machine gunned. Uh, but Cozy just... How nice of her. <laughs> she was. Oh, she was very kind, yes. They used to go up to the front line singing Land of Hope and Glory. But the records all have the massed choir of the Royal Air Force, Army and Navy singing along. It's very emotional. It is. It really is emotional. Um, what else do we like? Who do you all universally despise? Despise? Oh, the Beatles, the Eagles, <laughs> Fleetwood Mac, the Residents. Aha, that's an, let's stop here and talk about the Residents. Um, why? Why? Uh, because they attempt to be heavy, or what? I don't like the hype. I think it's unnecessary, and it's arrogant, and it's pretending not to play the game of the big record companies when in actually fact it's just another version of the record company game. I think they're too academic, and I think they're very, very old-fashioned, too. Very old-fashioned. Old-fashioned in what sense? Well, what they're doing is, is, is snippets of Frank Zappa's early stuff, and... Uh, touches of classical avant-garde, very 60s humour, really. And uh, I know for a fact that they, I mean, they're very old, they've been around for, I remember getting letters off them in 1973 with a square flexi disc, which I threw into the bin. I wish I'd kept it because I could have sold it now. Made a lot of money for a collector. And I hate those apparently Louisiana voices. I can't stand country and western music, and so even a joke version just drives me up the wall, I'm afraid. Some of the instrumental technique, some of the, you know, I mean, on the, on the right day, the instrumentals can be passable, you know. Snake finger and... and oh, he's stuff. horrible. Have you ever met him? <laughs> no. Oh, he's, he's, he's English and he's such a prat. Oh. A prat. I don't know the term. A prat. That. It's um, a wimp combined... Oh, is it still on? Yeah. A wimp combined with an arrogant kiss-type figure. You know, oh. <laughs> completely self-opinionated and convinced he's a genius and everyone else is stupid and doesn't deserve a smile and it's all so mysterious and cool, man, and you don't deserve to know the answers. Oh, it's horrible. He came back to England recently and everybody that ever met him agreed he was the most objectionable person they'd ever come across. So I can't be wrong. Really, ugh. avoid the residents, burn their records, burn down the cryptic corporation, please, please. Kill them on the street. They're all middle-aged anyway. They don't deserve to keep going. If we can find out who they are, we're going to expose them. Like that, Kiss. Oh, Kiss, everyone knows who they are. They don't deserve exposing because they stick to what they do. They're all right, Kiss. There's a difference, you see. Kiss, I don't mind any group that does what it says it's setting out to do. And Kiss said it's a comic book thing and it's a hype and it's commercialism and it's heavy metal and the kids like it. And it's straightforward investment and returns. That's okay. I don't like it personally, 
but it's no, there's no real hypocrisy involved. Uh, the residence there is to me, they're very academic, there's never a surprise, it's much, much too cool. I like things where something happens that you don't expect, where it's uncouth and it, it can suddenly become vulgar or awkward. But it seems to me that, that both Robin Gristle and the residence elicit the same kind of response and that you like it because it's either strange or it's different or it's amusing from the fact that you really can't understand it and you don't even bother to try. But it, it's just there and it's, it's just odd. Uh, I hope not. I don't think so. The people that buy our records, I thought they all played them while they made a cup of tea or put them on while they wrote letters to friends. Some of us put them on uh, the little insert that's in the second annual report yeah. about the evil English people with the girl and her boyfriend that I tried that. Oh, yeah. I actually found it enjoyable. Yeah, sex. I mean, I, I know it's obviously true that there'll be a certain number of people who do buy it just to be able to say, hey, man, I've got the weird record by that English group. And because of the distance, we probably seem a bit mysterious, just like the residents do in Europe. Uh, but we don't consciously generate that, the fact that people can come round to our house in England, schoolboys and people, and meet us, and we get 100 or 150 letters a week, and we do write back to everyone ourselves. And uh, when we play live, we don't go in the dressing room, we always stay on the stage before and after, and people can come and talk to us as long as they want. Those and who haven't been blinded by the halogen lights. Those who haven't been blinded or gone home. Uh, well, I was saying, as far as the, the reaction is, sure, it's it's uh, incorrect, but a lot of it is is you know again misunderstanding. You misunderstand the residents as much as you misunderstand Robin Gristle, and that you 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 get it or you listen to it because it's it's odd. Well, I mean, the people I've met since I've been over here this time don't seem to think that way. They usually say it's nice to know they're not alone and that we see the world the way they see it. That's basically the response I get from people I meet. And that's what I want. That's all we're doing. We're more like journalists than musicians. We don't want a rock and roll career or a music career. And we don't make records in order to see how many we can sell. We really don't. We, it's just a hobby that's got out of hand. That's all it is. Professions. Yeah. Aside from Cozy, who we know about. Who's a naughty girl, yeah. yes. Um, well, she's at least not as bad as she used to be because she used to do porno movies. Uh, Sleazy, he works as a partner in Hypnosis who do those very surreal photographic LP covers like for UFO and Paul McCartney and Led Zeppelin, uh, Pink, Floyd. Pink Floyd, oh yes, Ooh. and um, oh Peter Gabriel. Is it true what I heard about uh, the UFO cover? That that is the, the faucet one is me and Cozy in a bath, yes. That and was edited here so that you can't make it out. That's true. I, I was in, in the book. It shows it. The is it the hypnosis book or the album cover album one of them? And uh, in America they kind of painted over us so we were like little ghosts in the bath. Whereas in the English version you can see my bum. <laughs> Can you make the faces out so that uh, people know who you are? Not really, no, no. It was meant to be ambiguous, so it, I had a ponytail. I had long hair then, you see, and Cozy had a ponytail. And it was meant to look like it could be two blokes or it could be two girls or it could be a bloke and a girl. It was deliberately meant to be an ambiguous couple, but it's us, definitely us. They built that bathroom, actually, in a derelict house. And it was taken in the winter, and it was sub-zero temperatures. And I was just wearing a T-shirt and cosy, just a pair of white canvas trousers. And we were in that bath for about four hours. And it was really, really cold. And they kept taking these pictures and saying it wasn't right. And then suddenly they turned on the shower, and there was no hot water, of course. So this freezing water shot all over us, and they took the photo. And I was screaming, you rotten, beep, 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 beep. Thank you. And... Um, I'd had for life. <laughs> and they said it was a great photo. That's the one, of course, in typical Hollywood style. And we got £30 for that, which is $60. But it Probably paid good. the phone bill. Good. So now you know. Now we've got, we've got two members of Crab and Gristle, career pegged. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, me, I'm on the dole, which is welfare. I have been for eight years. Can you tell us how? How I've been on it for that long? Yeah. Yeah, well... Um, I had a friend who was a professional burglar way up, way back in Yorkshire when we lived in Yorkshire in the north of England and he told me how to sign on and keep on for a long time which I did 
And then after a while, they got very suspicious of me and said that they wanted to give me psychological tests and psychiatric tests because anyone who was unemployed that long must be crazy or lazy, which is reasonable. And so it was either stop the money or go along with them and let them do the tests. So I did all these aptitude tests so they could tell me what job I ought to have. And what, I did had, they, what did they come up with? Well, it was, I mean, it was the perfect answer because at the end, is it still working? Yeah. Oh. Um, at the end of it, I had to. They had lots and lots of hundred questions, and there was three alternative answers. And you had to put the pin through the square for the answer you wanted to give least, and the one you wanted to give most. And they were really obvious the way they were trying to angle it. It would say, if you were working on the local amateur theatre play, would you rather sell tickets at the door, be the producer, or be the leading actor? So it was clear: were you retiring and shy? Did you have a lot of ambitions and extrovert tendencies, or did you like to be the one in control? I mean, it was so obvious what they were trying to find out. But I did it anyway and stuck pins through. And at the end, it's an American test, by the way. You invented it, so... We have a lot of them over here for high school aptitude yeah. and stuff. Yeah. It's not so common in England, so it was kind of interesting to do. And then they, they take away all the pages, and there's a, a pattern of holes on the back. And um, they look at the pattern and figure out what you're meant to be. What's the matter? Am I too close? <laughs> Yeah? Pete! Oh, oh, ow! Yeah. Oh. Now I know what the clicks are. Thank you. Sorry, America. And, um, where were we? Oh, yes. No, well, they said at the end that the, the final result was that I was equally, equally talented to either be everything or nothing. In other words, it didn't tell them anything at all. So then they decided I must be crazy and sent me to the local mental asylum to be tested by psychiatrists. And I knew that if they decided I was crazy, they could keep me in. Um, but they gave me six months of money until I had to go there. And then the day I was meant to go, I went on the wrong day and told them, I, I, well, I really didn't realize it was the wrong day. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, is it Thursday? I thought it was Wednesday. So they gave me looks as if to say, we knew he was crazy. But I went in and I did the tests. And I was amazed. It was this guy who was about 60 years old and white-haired, and he was the main doctor for the whole of the north of England. And at the end of it, he said, I really like the sound of your group. Can I have one of the posters? As <laughs> How long ago was this? This was in 1973. And I said, of course you can. He said, I really, he said, basically, he said, there's nothing wrong with you. You'd just get bored in any job you did. And within two weeks, you'd start to cause trouble. And I said, that's what I told them at the beginning. And he said, well, I'll give them a letter saying this. You're not mad, but you're not suitable for employment. And so I was classed unemployable. And uh, so now they they just have to keep pensioning me off. Very nice. I bet. Yeah. And the fourth fourth of the TG. That's Chris Carter. Yeah, he drives a delivery van for a glass manufacturer. He just delivers sheets of glass part time, and the rest of the time he stays up till dawn every night building strange electronic gadgets. He's an obsessive worker, totally obsessive. If he's not doing that, he's building something else or re repairing the house. Is he related to Roger Ruskin Spear? No, no. Oh. But he did, I mean, he's totally self-taught in electronics. And ABC Television, which is your American company, their English office approached him for the Jubilee year, and he built them an entire radio studio from scratch for outside broadcasts and everything. And he'd never done that before. He just built it straight off. And they were so impressed that the New York office offered him a job as their worldwide studio engineer, totally self-taught, and he turned them down. He said he was too busy with dropping gristle, so they don't like him anymore. I guess he could always go and approach them, but they were upset. They did buy copies of all the records, though, to find out why he wanted to stay with us. Uh, that's it, really. I'm the, I'm the one who's the laziest, obviously. <laughs>